What if what we've learned about the birth of Jesus is wrong? Who were the Magi? What were their role in society, in the world? I believe that what you're gonna to learn tonight is going to shock you. Plus, we're gonna dive into what was Jesus' source of income when he was here on this earth? Where did his wealth go? How did the Magi break hell's economy over Jesus' life and what that means for you. Plus, we're gonna be talking about the Luciferian system that is operating in this world right now and what you can do to break free from it. We're so excited. But before I introduce our guest tonight, I want you to introduce yourself. Right there where you are, right in the comments, where you're watching from and what you're believing God for. But listen, I believe that a lot of holy cows are about to be tipped over and you're gonna learn some things you've never heard before. To have the author of the amazing book, Breaking Hell's Economy, Joseph Z on the program with us. He is an amazing minister of the gospel. He's a broadcaster. He's a prophetic voice to this generation. Would you welcome to Encounter Today, Joseph Z. Joseph Z, man, it is so good to finally get you on the program. We had some technical difficulties before, but it's good to have you on Encounter today. Alan, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. Man, I'm I told you this before the broadcast. This book, Breaking Hell's Economy, in a minute we're going to talk about the Magi, the things we don't know about the birth of Christ, the things we know, don't know about the events surrounding what we call uh, Christmas. But this book, you know, I read a lot of books. I get a lot of books on my desk every single week. And I'm just going to kind of read them and then I'm going to be done with them. This will never leave my bookshelf. It will always wow. be a point of reference, something that I always use. Uh, forward by Gene Bailey. Um, yes. I, you had some of the who's who. Rick Renner wrote an endorsement for this book. Of course, when you read it, yeah. you understand why, because you dig in deep like he does. What was the impetus of this book? What caused you to start writing this book? Honestly, I had a word from the Lord to do it. I was writing a different book on prophecy and, and, and a whole different direction. And the Lord apprehended me, Alan, and said, I want you to write this book. And he gave me the name, Breaking Hell's Economy. Wow. Well, it, it's not, It's not. I thought when I got it, another prosperity book. It is not another prosperity right. book. This <laughs> no, book is not. not about prosperity. This is about literally no. breaking the grip of Satan off of this world by breaking right. his hold on the economy. But let's, let's get into the reason for the season. Let's talk a little bit about um, the story surrounding the birth of Jesus. And okay. you dig into the Magi, who they were, and how the Magi broke hell's economy over Jesus. Come on! It's so thrilling, when, I'm telling you, <laughs> when you read this book. So let's just, let's just walk back. Who are the Magi? Where do they come from? What's the story surrounding well, they they really start out with, it, it goes all the way back to the prophet Daniel. When he set up, you know, what he set up within the Babylonian system, where he was, and they come from an ancient group called the Chaldeans, which leads all the way to modern day, the time of Jesus. Hmm. And they are kingmakers, that's what they did. They were kingmakers that traveled around and they had more authority than honestly, many of the militaries in, in countries and nations, they were able to travel cross uh, international lines and not be interrupted because of their authority and respect and honestly their ability uh, mil military wise. So what caused them to be interested in the birth of Jesus? What, what were they following after? Well, that's the fascinating thing is they were they were studying the stars. They were looking at things and we know this and I know you know this, Alan, but the stars were put there in a sense where God made it to tell the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, and astrology and all the things that have happened today have hijacked what God created. And so they were studying the stars, they were doing it, but they were following prophecies to find the Messiah. And they were looking at for the king of the world, the king of the universe. So they now, so they're following these signs in order to find mm -hmm. Jesus. What are some of the things that we get wrong about the narrative surrounding the birth of Jesus? Before we get into the gifts <laughs> that they brought, certainly, what are some things we get wrong? You really go into deep detail. There's no way we oh, can yeah. get to all of it that you have in the right. book, but give us some highlights. 
I'd say one of the things we get wrong about is we think they were we three kings, you know, going <laughs> through the desert, riding on the camels, doing the things they're doing. But actually what we get wrong is we look at it that they were just three lowly kings that brought their little humble gifts, but they traveled with an entourage. I mean, these guys, when they traveled, it was with a very large scenario. They had many different uh, uh, soldiers and people, and it was a caravan. It was not three kings. It was several several people, uh, hundreds of people that would travel across the landscape together carrying loads and loads of treasure. And so that's the imagery is, is a caravan. It, it was not just three kings going through the desert singing, we three kings, we travel so far. It was much more than that. Well, you, we talk about this, which is so practical. I can't believe I, you know, I'd never really thought of it this way. They had an army with them, obviously, right. in order to protect the wealth that they're carrying. Is that right? That's right. That's correct. They had an army, trained soldiers that even the local militaries of cities and regions were afraid of. They wouldn't mess with them. These guys were the elite of the elite, and they were uh, the special forces, so to speak, in that time. So what are they bringing then? So they're looking for Jesus. Do they do they show up when he's a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger, or is there a no, little bit of time? It took was, them a while to get to him. It's true. He's a little bit older, and he was prepared for them at that point where he was older. When they came to Jesus, he was a youth. He was just a little bit older. And when they showed up on the scene with him, he he was there, and he was not in the little cave like you know we see portrayed and with the animals and all this. No, they came to him. And I'll tell you what, they came to to the area where Herod was very distraught uh, before they even got to Jesus. They terrified Herod. There were so many of them that they shook the area. Jesus being older, they came, and as you were, you were pointing out, they brought a tremendous amount of wealth mm -hmm. to him. And uh, there's a whole narrative with that. But I got to tell you, when they came in the area, they were kingmakers, and everybody knew what these guys were coming to do. When they came into an area, they were known as kingmakers, and they had the authority, get this, to remove a king or put a king into position. Wow. And Herod was terrified. And that's why when it says that he came there and the whole city was in turmoil and all the things were happening, Herod was wondering, um, what are you doing here? What are you here to do with me? Where is this headed? Are you here to bring peace or are you here to remove me? And so he wanted to be at peace with them. And so... And of course, they came with their entourage, military uh, uh, caravan, and they brought their great wealth with them. All right, so let's talk about these, these gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yes. We think of these small little containers that they brought and kind of, you know, like a, <laughs> right. a, a, a jewelry box that's opened before Jesus. That's correct. What were these gifts? What was the amount or the value of them? And what do they represent? Well, they represent a number of things. You know, there's gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They, they're no, they were symbolic scenarios, especially for his death. Myrrh was a symbolism of death, and that's what that was all about. The gold and frankincense were just highly valuable items. All of them were, and they became famous on what they called the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And there was a great, uh, you know, economic scenario with it. But what they really were doing is they're coming to equip Jesus with an astronomical amount of wealth. And you got to consider this, the fact that they came from where they came from and they were going to find not just a king, the king. Mm. Alan, they were going to find the king. And when they brought these resources to him, they were coming to finance or give the best gift they could muster to the king of the world. And so numerically speaking, you know, some people estimate things that this was into the multiple millions worth of dollars, maybe even upwards of a billion plus dollars that this could have been in value or beyond. It was astronomical in value. So what then happened? So Jesus now is, at, what, two years of age, possibly around this time. Correct. And he yes. has this opulence, this enormous amount of wealth, which, which I suppose was kind of necessary. They had to run for their lives <laughs> in, in, order to, in order to hide. Um, what happens next? Why was this so important as far as breaking hell's economy over the life mm -hmm. of Jesus? Well, the way I see it and the way I believe it's very clearly laid out in history is when they brought these resources, they financed 
his whole life, his whole ministry. And I believe they helped Mary and Joseph travel to where they needed to be, do what they needed to do. But the unique part about it is, is that Jesus, although he was given everything, he became wealthy, he became rich, or, or rather he became poor is what the scripture says, that we might become rich. Mm. I believe very powerfully they gave him this resource. It broke off the hold of darkness. It financed everything he wanted to do. And then he took that and he didn't avail himself to the whole amount. I believe he used it for our benefit. And I think that's how he not only helped Mary and Joseph, but I believe his uncle became a steward of it. Yeah, well, it's important that people remember, especially that verse, he became poor that we might become rich. There was nothing that's substitutionary right. about the life of Jesus. His substitution no. was on the cross. So people Come often think that he, he was poor while he was here on this planet. No, 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 no. Supernatural no. provision came into his life and he supplied, interestingly enough, we never think of this. I think you talk about this in the book. He's got staff. He's That's got, right. He's got, he's got the families that oh. he has to take care of. From Herod's household. He had people there. He had, he had partners with him. He had many people. Now, when Jesus did this, though, and he got all the wealth, Al, and one of the things that is, is so vital to recognize, although he didn't avail himself to the full amount and spend it like Solomon. Remember, the Bible says that one greater than Solomon was here. Wow. One who is greater than Solomon. That's what the scripture says about him. Now, if we're going to take words and words mean anything, and I think they do, uh, if one that is greater than Solomon is here, that means that Solomon being the rich richest, most wisest person ever on the face of the earth, uh, he had some means. Mm -hmm. And I believe Jesus had that at his fingertips. I believe he was above uh, health care systems. Jesus was above uh, taxes. Jesus was above all that. Although he complied with the laws of the land and the rules of the land, Jesus superseded all these things and including he could materialize wealth from a fish's mouth if he needed to. Mm. And yet I believe he held back all of that. So he became poor by pouring that out, by not being glorified as he was in heaven, in addition to what he could muster with his earthly wealth. And I believe he did not avail himself to the completeness of that so we could become rich. He paid that price forward. And I believe where the wealth went uniquely enough, I believe it went to Joseph of Arimathea. I believe mm. he became the man that took over Jesus's wealth. Because if you look in some historical scenarios, you realize Joseph of Arimathea, he traveled in precious metals. He did other things and some extra biblical Historical documents talk about Jesus possibly went with him to other lands and traveled and got cultured, uh, just like he did with Joseph, his father in uh, Sephoris. And so it's just a fascinating thing you look at. But I do believe Jesus poured out all that ability so we could have it, a supernatural exchange. I thought foxes have holes and <laughs> birds have nests, but the Son right. of Man has nowhere to lay his head. How does that... And Come how on. does that... You need to, that seems contradictory. What's going on here? It does. Well, when Jesus said that, you know, you and I both know he was talking about going to the city of the Samaritans. He was going there. And as they were going there, they began to say, hey, you can't stay here. You can't be here. And when a new recruit basically came to join Jesus, he said, well, Tonight, sometimes it's like this. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have where they go, and the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's like, sometimes we just got to grin and bear it, you guys. That's what he was saying. But that didn't mean anything in regards to his abilities with wealth and resources. Jesus had a treasurer. And I don't know about you, Alan, but I don't think I would have trusted his treasurer. Jesus had a lot of <laughs> grace and mercy. He had Judas as his treasurer. And of course, he had um, you know supporters from Herod's household. He had wealthy people around him him. And it's a powerful thing when you understand Jesus had partners. Yeah. And one of the greatest miracles of Pentecost is that these individuals, 120, could take 10 days after his resurrection and just hang around and fast and pray. I don't know how many yes. of you could take 10 days off and uh, without any credit and be able to feed your family and take <laughs> care of your family. There had to be That's supernatural right. supply, supernatural wealth that was imparted. So you were saying that you thought his wealth, all of his wealth after his death, or are you saying before yeah. his death it went to Joseph of Arimathea? I believe, I believe it went before. I believe that he was a caretaker because when we don't know when his father Joseph died, mm -hmm. but 
you know, and, and we can't prove this emphatically, but there's a lot of things that would point to it. So it is my belief that it went to Joseph of Arimathea and he oversaw it. He became the caretaker of Jesus's wealth. And consequently, Joseph of Arimathea not only provided for Jesus's tomb, mm -hmm. but Joseph of Arimathea became arguably the richest guy in the whole region. And so there's something to that and there's a, a narrative with it. And I like your point and to, to bring that closer, we recognize Jesus did even upon death, maybe from Joseph of Arimathea, finance all of his followers, finance his immediate disciples and staff. Yeah, that's really outstanding uh, to think of. And when you wrote this book, this is really an end time guide to navigating yes. these, these difficult economic waters we find ourselves in, which normally this it conversation is. would be for the upper crust, the top shelf, top 1% right. talking about economy. But no, now we understand with food shortages and all that's going on around the world, how important this is. So how does this relate then? Why is this revelation important for the end time believer today? Well, we recognize in the book of Exodus, we see that there was darkness in the land, right? Mm -hmm. The intense darkness, darkness covered the land. There was 10 plagues and that plague of darkness was on the land for three days. And Alan, we realized that that darkness was something the Bible says could be felt. It was palpable. It was like ink and it was beyond just a, a brooding sense. It was so dark, the Bible says that it was heavy and nobody got up from their chairs. Nobody left their dwellings. They didn't move around. They didn't even really converse with one another. They were in a lockdown status. They were in a place where they couldn't move. And yet there's another area called Goshen. And there was a supernatural scenario going on in Goshen. They had blood on the doorpost during the death angel scenario. All these things happened. And in Goshen, there was a supernatural light that shined out of the darkness. It wasn't a flame. It wasn't the flicking of a bick. It wasn't any of those things. It was supernatural. The light of God shined out of Goshen. And Alan, it's just like Isaiah chapter 60, when it says darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness, the people, mm. but arise shine for your light has come. And then it goes on to say, that the Gentiles will come to that light. The, the abundance of the sea will be turned towards you. And you know, I look at that and I see Matthew chapter six, verse 33, where it starts talking about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the verses just before that say, do not worry about what you will wear, what you will eat, what you're gonna do. These are all the things the Gentiles seek. Hmm. And then in Matthew six thirty-three. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And then notice, it's the things the Gentiles seek. So when you take Isaiah 60, Matthew chapter 6, and you look at what's happening, you recognize that the abundance of the sea is talking about there's going to be a wealth shift, a transfer. Something's going to happen there where the abundance of the sea is turned towards the righteous, and the light that's upon the righteous is not only the tangible glory of the Lord, there's going to be a supernatural horsepower on resource hmm. that gets the attention of the world. And it says the Gentiles seek these things and they will come to the light that's on the righteous. Now, when people hear this, immediately these, this type of conversation triggers people. And I got to wonder, uh, For sure. you, you had to have gotten a lot of kickback concerning this book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a mixed thing because you know, God is all good. He's got so many good things to give us. And in the middle of darkness, he wants us to shine. I like to say it this way. God wants us to win more than we do. Hmm. And this is really a book about a collision of cultures. It's yes. a book about a collision of kingdoms. And one kingdom has doing and trying and striving and struggling and by the sweat of your brow and by toil. And at the end of it, you just, you know, can all you, you get, get all you can. And then, and then when you're done, you just, you sit on your can, right? Hmm. But you recognize that we need to be in the blessing of the Lord, the strength of God, and that is how we begin to break out. We're supposed to be a light in darkness. We're not supposed to fear the end or the last days. God has created a supernatural provision for us to trust him. Jesus said, when you see all these things, let not your heart be troubled. See that you are not afraid because there's so much more that he has for us. And I think there's a hidden vein of gold of trusting him that will illuminate light in the darkness, not just monetary, not just monetary, 
but as a collision of kingdoms where the kingdom of God, the gates of hell will not overcome the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell is a system with all that evil monetary stuff that we see going on with all these antichrist agendas and nefarious characters right now, but it is the system of Jesus, the ecclesia that the gates of hell cannot overcome. But we need to know that. And we need to stand up in it to push back this darkness. That's what I think, Alan. That's what I see the Lord saying. Yeah, well, there's a there's this tide of demonic propaganda against the subject yes. of prosperity that has brainwashed believers right. to the point that when they hear any trigger word, it's interesting, people who are against a triggered society are easily triggered when it comes <laughs> to the right. subject of prosperity, and they immediately have this visceral reaction to it because they, they do. don't want to partner with the spirit of mammon. They don't want anything to do with it, and what they don't realize is often they're being manipulated by the spirit of mammon because the spirit of mammon, in my estimation, hates the prosperity message because it's a liberating message and he wants to keep people bound economically. You go into great detail in the book about the spirit of mammon. What yep. is the spirit of mammon and what's the difference between mammon and prosperity? Well, first and foremost, Alan, the spirit of mammon is just that. It's a spirit. Mm -hmm. It's a demon. But then it also empowers a humanistic spirit, which was displayed for us in Genesis chapter 11 when you see the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, which his name means we rebel. And everything having to do with mammon means I got this, God. I don't need you. Mammon is the definition of the love of money, self-provision. You don't need God's system. You need your system. I'm going to work, get what I can, do what I'm going to do, get what I can keep and do that. And mammon is the Antichrist's economy. Mammon is hell's economy. Mammon is man's provision for themselves. It's a humanistic spirit, which says we don't need God. So truly the blessing is God's economy where you give and receive, you sow, you reap. You get into God's economy where it's more blessed to give than to receive even, and you continue going down that road, and that just busts up mammon. If people are worried about mammon or the love of money, just so become a radical giver and watch what happens. Yeah, it's interesting. They don't want you to talk about prosperity because they say it's selfish. And we say, okay, well, we're going to right. break the power of greed <laughs> and selfishness by commanding people to give. Well, then, no, you can't do that because then you're, you're, so it's this impossible situation that this demonic spirit is, has put the church in, and we can't listen to it any longer. We've got to get, right. allow this book to reprogram and renew your mind by the washing yes. of the Word of God for last day's supernatural provision. And you, you talk about something really interesting, that seeking prosperity is about more than God's people being rich. It's about That's making right. God rich, which is really Come interesting. On. And you talk Come about on. this corporate anointing that can make God rich. That's a yes. head scratcher. Now you got to break that down for us. Okay, Alan, here's, here's the deal in a nutshell. What we realize is God doesn't lack anything. God has everything. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the silver, all the gold, all the stuff. God owns everything. He doesn't have any lack of anything except one thing. God does not have his lost kids. Hmm. He doesn't have souls. He's missing souls. So the way we make God rich is by bringing him his lost kids. Wow. And if we can win a dying world, what happens there is we bring his lost kids in. And when we bring his lost kids in, that's something God will finance. That's the reason the Bible tells us so clearly. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes us rich, Proverbs 10, says. But that rich is not just to be a self-satisfying rich. It's rich with a purpose. It's a rich to get the gospel preached around the earth to ultimately make God rich. And that's, that's the whole deal there, is just making God rich. That's why we're called to prosper. And here's the other thing, and this is why I love you so much, and I love your program, Alan. The oh, anointing that's on you, the strength that's on you, my friend, is so palpable, it's so powerful. And what God's doing to raise your light right now, I'm just celebrating, and I'm privileged to see you. Because I gotta tell you, there's going to be a run of two more years, and it's gonna pivot, and then you're gonna really multiply. I can see it wow. on you, God's hand is there, people are gonna come 
come under you to the north, south, east, and west. You're going to yes. start to see people and sons and daughters put their feet under your table, and they're going to begin to say, I don't know what to do with this ministry. Would you take it? Would you help me? You're mm -hmm. going to begin to see an onslaught of that come, and then the apostolic brand that's really on your life is going to manifest brightly. And there's the passing away of a significant leader, and then you will step fully into that anointing. I see it for you, oh, man of God. But between you and I even, like this type of relationship, what God's doing with so many of us is he's bringing a corporate anointing together. The body of Christ mm. was never made to just have individuals have all the wealth individually. He's called us to grow as a corporate superpower. We can be the number one most powerful superpower wow. in the world, impacting every segment of society with revival, with repentance, with deliverance, with the breakthrough of God, where we begin to rise up and God will finance that. It's not a, a lacking money problem that we have. It's a lacking of order. It's a lacking of vision. It's a lacking of proper governmental structure that we need in the body of Christ right now. And when we come together as a corporate superpower, then there'll be no lack among us mm. because there's some people gifted to manage resources. There's other people gifted to make resources. There's other people gifted to administrate. And I call it the 521, all the gifts in the body. But I'll tell you, the corporate superpower is called to solve as the body of Christ, all the answer, all the issues and bring answers to the society. Alan, I'm so stirred with you. Yeah, I feel, I feel the power of God on you, man. Yeah. I, you, uh, you know, men and women of God like yourself, sir, they pay a high price to be where you are. And people look at it and they say, my goodness, this is amazing what God's doing through a man of God. But when I see a man of God that's paid a price like you have, and you do it with sweetness, and you do it with the anointing on you. I'll tell you what, I know that your ministry is going to not only be a last day's impacting voice, but it's gonna go global like you've never seen it before. Wow. And God's saying, faithful. I call you faithful and I can trust you. Man, I just hear that so oh, loud for you and all of your team. I can tell your team loves you. Yes. Praise God. Well, the feelings mutual and the audience, and that's a word for all of you who are watching this right now, a part of the Encounter Today family. We really consider you to be part of our family. That's a word. Wow. There's going to be a huge pivot coming, and we're already in preparation for it. So excited to hear what the Lord is doing. And I've got to ask you this because you mentioned it, this 521 principle yes. that you mentioned. Yes. What, what, is, what is that? I know you talk about it extensively on your media. Sure. The five, I call it the 521. And what it is, is there's three areas in scriptures, just, just fundamentally three areas. One, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about the manifestational gifts, the nine manifestational gifts. Romans chapter 12 is talking about the seven um, motivational gifts. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, it talks about the five, what I call governmental gifts. Mm -hmm. When you take all of them and add them up, they are 21 total. But then of that 21, there's five that are governmental. So I call it the five leading the 21, the 521. And, and that includes themselves. And so that is to me, the body of Christ. And I know there's other gifts we could add in there. We could, could do that. But on a sure. fundamental level, I believe it's the 521 and that's the body of Christ. And that's really what's called to change the world. And sometimes we get this idea that everybody's supposed to do the same thing, have the same anointings, do all the same mm -hmm. stuff. They see Bishop Allen and they think, boy, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. And really you're called to equip your viewers and called to equip those who are watching you. And then as the 521, they go out and change the world. Wow. And um, that's the summary of that. What do you think, as far as the fivefold ministry office gifts are, where do you think we're lacking? Do you believe there's kind of a resurgence coming of these five governing gifts? And what are some key ones that you think are going to begin to be revived or God's going to breathe some his breath on? I do. I think the apostle and prophet and specifically the evangelist. The Lord told me at the beginning of this year uh, that there would be a watch for the powerful twos. I heard the word watch for the powerful twos. He's going to make alliances between twos. And I mm. saw it with specifically the apostle, excuse me, the prophet and the evangelist. Yes. I saw the prophet and the evangelist teaming up like never before. And the Lord said, watch the evangelist this year and next year. But in the last days, I believe we're going to see a healthy return to true apostolic authority, because I think most people, and I, and I don't mean this with any criticism, I say this very humbly, but I believe there's a, a, a cheapening of the titles. Yes. And, and when you see apostles that are called apostles, most of them 
are not. Yeah. Um, when you see prophets that are called prophets, there's many that are and some just are not. And I don't mean that negatively, but there's a very high price you pay where finally the Lord says, and this is what you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just how I look at that. But I believe it's going to be a more accurate definition because titles can sometimes cheapen things and yes. take away from the legitimate. And I believe there's going to be a redefining and a sharpening uh, of those definitions. The gift should speak for itself. You don't Come have on. to wonder who a plumber is. You can just look at what they're doing and you can say that's, that's a plumber, right. you know? That's and, right. Uh, I think that we're going to certainly see a revival of, of those those gifts, which is that's truly outstanding. Do you believe that uh, there's really a, a Luciferian system that we're battling against right now, especially economically. How, yes. How do you see that, and how would we discern that, recognize it? How do we break that? Well, I'll tell you, I do believe that there is a Luciferian system, and I believe it's growing. I think we got things like the World Economic Forum with Klaus Schwab and some of these guys yeah. that are running down the road, and they're trying to not only mess with us economically. I, I love, yeah, I don't love, I really don't like it, but the quote where he says, um, you will own nothing and you will love it. <laughs> you know, he's like a super villain, right? He's like, um, yes. $100 million <laughs> is mine, right? Yeah. So he, that he's that good, guy. <laughs> yeah. He's that guy, but then also you see these guys, like they call him the prophet, that guy Noah, and all these different ones that are not only wanting to mess with our economics, they want to mess with our DNA. They want to mess with everything else around us because the Luciferian system is just simply an extension or empowered or empowers hell's economy. It's mm. empowering the gates of hell. The gates of hell is a system. When it talks about in 1 John, when it says this is the power, even our faith, that overcomes the world. Alan, you know this, but that word for world in 1 John is talking about the word cosmos, and it's the K-O-M-O-S, cosmos. And it means the system of government or the mood of the culture as well, the zeitgeist by which we're living. And when you see this, it's talking about a cosmos and it's a world system. It is our faith as the 521 that overtakes the world system, the Luciferian Antichrist agenda, gates of hell that is trying to run this culture into the ground. And we're called to break that by becoming mature believers, standing up in the fullness of God, because both the church and the world deserve to see something, mature believers. And when we stand up in that capacity as a 521, we will smash that because I don't believe the Antichrist can take full authority until we're no longer in the way. Yeah, no, 100%. And for some reason, that's becoming a, a rarer and rarer, more unique position. It's true. 30 it's years true. ago, it was widely accepted that that was, of course, the Antichrist cannot take power while this dynamic force called the church is in the way. Come on. A, 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 a bald-faced reading of Second Thessalonians chapter 2 makes that absolutely clear. But we're drifting from that. Do you think that's part of the end-time deception, that this I understanding do. of the imminence of the Lord's return is really loosening its grip? Man, I like how you say that. That's true, because I believe very clearly that if we begin to believe a narrative that is not true, the only weapon the devil has is deception. Yeah. And if he can deceive the elect, if he can deceive people into believing, well, you're weaker than you really think you are. The ecclesia doesn't have that much horsepower. You're not going to be able to stand up to this stuff. I believe that by by deception or by bad teaching, we're going to begin to allow more things on the planet than should be allowed. Yeah. The gates of hell are not able to prevail or overcome the church. But somewhere along the line, we're saying, oh, the Antichrist is coming. He's already here. And I get the part where it talks about in Revelation 13, where it says there will be power given to him to overcome the saints. But I don't believe the saints in that narrative are the same as the ecclesia in my opinion. Obviously. And so I believe that it is <laughs> I believe that it is the revelation of the Lord that we can rise up and we can push back this yeah. evil Luciferian agenda. I really well, do. It's the saints that Daniel refers to, I believe in chapter 9 Come where the, the antichrist is going to weary the saints, those are the same saints that are being referenced in the book of Revelation. Of course, everything after chapter 4 in Revelation turns very Jewish 
and and its references <laughs> yes. whereas before it's just church 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 and then all of a sudden all the attention turns to the nation of israel 144,000 jewish evangelists and the, the, those saints are being persecuted boy there's a lot of directions we can go in right here <laughs> as we're as we're talking because i get a lot of people i've had even this last week someone told me we're supposed to be warriors we're not trying to we shouldn't be running from the antichrist and i said listen we're we're not running from the antichrist we are that's warriors right. that's why yeah. he can't take power that's right while we're here that's right alan i'll tell you you know there's a there's this thing and i don't know if you're watching this now and i'm sure you've had a lot of commentary yourself on this but there's this thing where they're saying don't get too political don't go down these roads don't mm -hmm. do this don't do that in my mindset and maybe I'm missing something here, but in my mindset, as we're Christians and we're believers, we're the 521, we're the body of Christ. The body of Christ, wherever our feet are, is where we're supposed to be salt, light, have influence, preach the gospel. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Acts, he was called to preach to first the Gentiles, mm -hmm. then to kings, and then to the Jews. Wow. And when you look at that picture, many people talk about, yes, he's called to the Gentiles, but he got it confused with the Jews all the time, but they very seldom talk about he was called to kings. Hmm. Paul was called to preach to kings, and that's why he appealed to Caesar. And I believe in this culture, sometimes we gotta remember, we're called to minister to leaders of influence, to go into areas people don't wanna be in, and the 521, the body of Christ, needs to do this so we can either, uh, man, change this culture Culture, or we need to raise up a generation who will. Wow. Well, everybody's so passionate about going into the needy communities where they're financially needy, as right. if the affluent communities don't need Jesus. And what you discover is they need a whole lot more Jesus in the affluent community oftentimes. <laughs> That's right. Than in the needy community. As we, as we move forward, and I think for the podcast at Encounter Underground, I want to go a little deeper into this Luciferian system and Klaus Schwab and, and all that stuff, and maybe even talk a little bit more about end time eschatology. But heading into 2023, what do you yes. hear the Spirit of God saying to you and to the church at large? Well, I'll start, I'll get a running start at that because what I heard first is number one, in 2015, I was in, and I'm not all political, but I'm gonna say this anyway, I was in Trump Tower. Okay. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me while I was in Trump Tower. And I said, Lord, why am I in this tower before he announced and all these things were happening? And the Lord said to me, I've not graced you to know who is gonna win the presidency. And I said, well, then why am I here? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, because I've called you to pray for the next president. I said, okay. And then as I began to do that, I said, Lord, is America going to go down? Are the nations down? Is this the end? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me in 2015, no, America has one more round. Mm. And so do the nations. He said, because the young lions are coming. The young lions are coming. And so that very much stirred me up. And I said, my goodness. And I believe we're coming into that time where 2023, I heard the Lord say this to me in 2023, that it would be a strange year a very strange year. There's going to be a lot of unique things, difficult things, a lot of mixture and stuff where we begin to collide all the way to 24. I believe we're going to hear the roar in 24. Hmm. And when we hear the roar in 24, I believe it's going to be because there's going to be an accumulation of what I call, Alan, the micro wins or small victories that accumulate into a roar. And I believe Roe versus Wade started that. When uh, uh, the Lord spoke to me in 2020 and said Roe versus Wade will be overturned by the Supreme Court. It will be an unprecedented ruling. And we went public with that. We put it out. And the Spirit of the Lord is showing me that that was the beginning of many good things. And that has actually been the grace on this nation. Why we're going to have a little more preservation on us because of that one ruling right there. And I believe in 23 and 24, we're going to hear the roar. And I believe that's where we're headed. And the roar will be by the young lions. And there's three types of reformers he showed me, Alan. And it's going to be the young lions, the Cinderella's, and the burnt stones. And then the wild card, which I call the Rudolphs. But there's going to be the young lions, the burnt stones, and the Cinderella's. And the young lions are those who are filled with the strength of God. And they'll either build the institution or tear it to the ground, wow. whoever gets in their ears. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to be the Cinderella's, those who've had their inspiration stolen by institutions. They have the gifts. They've been put in the tower and they're used, they're used for their gifts and, and abilities. But the glass slipper is going to find them. And then there's coming the burnt stones. And the burnt stones, I like to liken it this way, Alan, are like the old John Rambos. They've seen too much. They've been in too many battles. They've just got too much going on. So they go 
hide out in the back 40 and they're sharpening a stick by the fire when the colonel comes along and finds me he's like johnny we got a battle you've never seen before we need you and he's like i don't do that anymore colonel i don't then my time is done but then it becomes so strong and so difficult he finally straps back on the military garb and goes and helps the young lions and i believe we're going to see burnt stones old warriors coming back to the scene and then of course the rudolphs and rudolph the red-nosed reindeer didn't get along with all the other reindeer he's actually an outcast that got turned into a broadcast his commo his oddity became his Come commodity on. right and i believe that's what we're going to see going into 24 and beyond we're going to have some wild reformers and their whole thing alan and, and you could probably attest to this with people you've raised up reformers they're called to breathe life into the institution even as it persecutes them. Wow. And in the middle of that persecution, the big challenge for reformers, which I just listed, what they're like, is going to be not being offended with the very institution they're supposed to breathe life into as it persecutes them. Because we know whatever the institution cannot control, it must kill or persecute. So walk through those four again. Those of you watching, uh, uh, as he lists these, I want you to write in the comments which one you think you are. And we're going to agree with you in prayer here in just a moment. But go through those four names again. What were they? Absolutely. It's the Young Lions. Young Lions, the yeah. Cinder the Cinderellas, Cinderellas. The Burnt Stones. John Rambo. And the Rudolphs. And, and the John Rudolphs. <laughs> <laughs> they drew first blood. So <laughs> write in the comments which one you believe you are. And in a moment here, um, Brother Z, I want you to pray for us, for us to step into that anointing, for us to step into that calling. And all of you watching, listen, I'm going to put the link for this book in the description, Breaking Hell's Economy, Your Guide to Last Day's Supernatural Provision. It is a treasure that you'll want to keep on your bookshelf for many, many years to come. And all of our interviews are done through your support, so we can't thank you enough. I want you to pray about sowing into this ministry and sowing in to the words that you've received today. And we have a special offer we want to give you. Go to EncounterToday.com and take advantage of that today. Pray about it. See what the Holy Spirit would have you to do. This holiday season, let's give a gift to the King himself, and let's be a blessing to the kingdom in Jesus' name. Brother Joseph, would you, would you pray for us that we would step into this anointing that hell's economy would be broken off of our lives yes i'd be pleased to father in jesus name i oh, speak to the audience today and i release a revelation because i declare over this audience you who are listening you who are watching a revelation be upon you in Jesus' name. Because a man or woman with a revelation is not at the mercy of a culture gone mad. And I release this revelation of the Lord to you, revelation of last day's provision, revelation of breaking the yoke at 30, 60, and 100 fold over your mm. life. I release a complete and total breakthrough for you over your children, over your family, over all that God's called you to do. On a bad day, I declare you're called to be the best there is. Jesus is with you, and you cannot be beat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. In Jesus' name. If you receive that right, I receive in the comments. And I'd be interested to hear from all of you watching. There's a lot that he said that kind of wrecks theology and, and makes you think about things differently. What was something in this interview that jumped out to you? Write it down in the comments, and make sure you get a hold of this book, Breaking Hell's Economy. Joseph Z, thank you so much for being with us on Encounter Today. Oh, I'm honored. My privilege. Thank you, Alan. We'll have to have you back real soon. And we're going to hop over to the podcast now, Encounter Underground, and get a little controversial and talk about some of these <laughs> things under this Luciferian system. But uh, thanks again, all of you watching. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Encounter Today. Go to EncounterToday.com and take advantage of the special offer. God bless. <laughs>